a Christian. He doesn't know what the implications of this are. He went to John Newton. Now, he was afraid to go to Newton. Newton was living in London at the time, and Newton had a reputation. And his reputation was, he's a flaming evangelical. He's one of those. And he's a holy roller type. His sense of decorum in the parliament now is that I'm, I'm a young parliamentarian. If people see me go to his house or it gets around that I visited this well-known evangelical, I don't know what it will mean. So he circled the block twice <laughs> before he got up the courage to knock on his door. Newton is 60 years old and he knocks on the door and goes in and God be praised, Newton told him to stay in politics. And then he wrote him a couple of years later, It is hoped and believed that the Lord has raised you up for the good of his church and for the good of the nation. So you document the little turns of providence in this man's life. Isaac Milner and Doddridge's book and visiting Newton any of which could have been so easily missed, you would think, and the life would have turned in another direction and the slave trade would not have been abolished, perhaps, for another century instead of when it was under this man's dynamic leadership. So he's now a Christian. He's 25 or 6 years old when he settles it. And he begins to use those recesses for the next 11 years until he marries to make up for time lost by studying. And here's, brothers, where I said I would say a word. Here's the way he, he described it himself. He got these months off. And instead of playing and playing on the French Riviera, he would go find somebody's house that would let him live there. And since he didn't own one, and he described it like this. I would spend the days studying about nine or ten hours a day, typically breakfasting alone, taking walks alone, dining with the host family and other guests, but not joining them in the evening until I came down about three quarters of an hour before bedtime for what supper I wanted. End quote. So for 11 years, I'm sure he didn't do it exactly like that every day, but that was his described regimen during his time away. Now, you don't all have that luxury to have those kinds of days away, but if you missed seminary, you didn't get converted till you were 40 or didn't have the money or it was a white school and they didn't want you to come or your white tradition didn't believe in formal education or whatever. Don't throw in the towel on the immense growth in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus that you can experience in the years you have left. You know, if you were 50 and you came up to me today and you said, I don't know Greek and I don't know Hebrew and I never had any formal education... What do you think I should do now with the rest of my life? I just might say, learn Greek. I might. I might not, too. But why not? Why not take two, three, four years and then have the last 10 or 15 to do some digging you'd never done before? Maybe. The cause of abolition was the main cause of his life. Let's talk about that for just a minute. Here's a Christian now, positioned in the House of Commons, age 25, 26. In 1787, Wilberforce wrote a letter in which he estimated that the annual export of slaves from the west coast of Africa for all nations exceeded 100 thousand a year. In 1804, 
This is three years before the victory. He estimated that from Guyana alone, where the British were specializing, not the Portuguese and the French and the others who were also involved, 12 to 15,000 a year human beings being captured, put below deck, shipped to the West Indies, those who made it. One year after his conversion, God's apparent calling fell on him. October 28, 1787, he wrote this in his diary. God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of morals. And what you hear in the connection of those two is root and branch, root and branch. And beneath that root of the reformation of morals leading to national transformation or cultural revolution in the abolition of this cultural sin, is those distinctive, peculiar doctrines down here. Christmas 1787, a few years before, a few uh, days before the recess began, Wilberforce stood up and served notice to the whole parliament that he would be bringing to them a motion in the spring for the abolition of the slave trade. That was the beginning of a 20-year battle. He just served notice. He laid down the gauntlet. I'm in this, and I'm not going away. Now, this is the main lesson of his life for us. He didn't go away. Because the battle was long, the defeats were many, the criticism was unstoppable. But he was not unstoppable. May 1789, he made a speech. Often his speech were four hours. The hours these men kept in the commons was unbelievable. They, their, their meetings would end three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. He wrote this, or he spoke this. I confess to you, so enormous, so dreadful, so irremediable did its wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for abolition. Let the consequences be what they would. I from this time determined that I would never rest until I had effected its abolition. He spoke of it with great sensibility about his own guilt, just like we often need to do. He said, speaking at another time to the parliament, I mean not to accuse anyone, but to take the shame upon myself in common indeed with the whole parliament of Great Britain for having suffered this horrid trade to be carried on under their authority. We are all guilty. We ought to all plead guilty and not to exculpate ourselves by throwing the blame on others. Ten years go by. Ten years. Defeat after defeat on the floor of the commons. He wrote, The grand object of my parliamentary existence is the abolition of the trade. Before this great cause, all others dwindle in my eyes. And I must say that the certainty that I am right here adds greatly to the complacency. That's an 18th century word for settled peacefulness, not indifference. We cannot use the word complacency today the way they did because it doesn't mean the same thing at all anymore in the 20th century. I adds greatly to the settled, peaceful confidence with which I exert myself in asserting it if it please God to honor me so far, may I be the instrument of stopping such a course of wickedness and cruelty as never before disgraced a Christian country. Then, 
1807 finally arrived.